This morning we're reading from the Word of God, Matthew chapter 3, and we're beginning to read on the 13th verse. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But uh, John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then we're reading from the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 11, verse 22. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. May God add a rich blessing to the reading of his own holy inspired word this morning. Last Sunday we began a series of messages on the basics of genuine Christianity. Last week we spoke on the inspiration of the scriptures, the authenticity, the infallibility of the word of God. And of course, when we're talking about basics this morning, we're talking about the principles, the fundamentals, and the foundational truths of genuine Christianity. Today we have much religion, but very little Christianity. Much religion and very little reality. But uh, we need to recognize that the Holy Scriptures, that they are the foundation of genuine Christianity. In fact, Jesus said that the man who builds his life on the Word of God is a wise man, that he is building upon a rock. And this morning, in our reading, he has challenged us to have faith in God. In fact, the scripture reminds us that without faith, it is impossible to uh, please God. Now, when we're talking about faith this morning, it's not something that is nebulous. It's not something that is far out. It's not something that's mythical. But faith is a reality. Faith is a substance. The Bible says that with faith comes a foundation, a confidence, a confirmation, assurance. It is the very tangible essence of God. It's basic of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. And this faith that is spoken of here is the faith of God that produces faith in God. And it comes to us by hearing the word of God. And with that kind of faith, we can have a solid foundation upon which to build our life, that the Word of God is facts. It's not fallacies, it's facts. It's based upon the very fact that, and God said, or the other one, thus saith the Lord. Now, 
The word of God is a creative word. It is a living word. And that creative living word creates faith in the heart of man to believe God. It's powerful. It's a powerful word of God. It ministers to the very soul and the heart and the inner being of man. Sometimes it cuts us to the heart. Other times it is a bomb of Gilead that heals the broken heart. And there's other times that it comforts and strengthens our hearts. Now when Jesus said, have faith in God, we recognize today there are many gods. There's Allah, and there's Krishna, and there's Buddha, and there's Shinto, and there are many gods. But when Jesus said, have faith in God, who is he referring to? Well, what is he like? What can we know about him? Can modern man today know God? And of course, the answer to all these questions is, yes, we can. We can know God. Jesus said that he is my father. Jesus said he is the one and only true God. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen God. That Christ himself is the incarnate deity, God veiled in human flesh. He is the Father's Son in whom the Father is well pleased with. In fact, this was verified twice. Once at the baptism of Jesus, and also at the Mount of Transfiguration, that this voice came from heaven and said, This is my, well, my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus Christ is the express image of God, that he in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It's an interesting thing that even at the day of his baptism that the Holy Spirit descended like a dove and rested upon him. And John tells us that God didn't give him the Holy Spirit by measure. He gave him the fullness of the Holy Spirit that he would go into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil and return in the power of the Spirit. And he went into the synagogue and said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The anointing power of the Holy Spirit resting upon the Son of God who gives eternal life. When we think about this this morning, this was the beginning of the ministry of Christ, and he did not begin his ministry until the anointing of the Spirit. And he said this, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And that acceptable year of the Lord is the year of salvation. And that's why we can say that today is the day of salvation, and now is the accepted time. He came to be the Savior of the world, 
your Savior and my Savior to save us from the penalty, the power, and the very presence of sin itself. And to change our hearts and our nature and our character to bring us into a fellowship and a relationship with the eternal God who is from everlasting to everlasting. The whole purpose of Christ coming into the world is to reveal God. That we might behold him with our eyes. And of course that generation did. They not only saw his person, they saw his miracles, his power, they witnessed Calvary, they witnessed his resurrection, revealed himself to them 16 different times in various places that he was alive. And these things have all been recorded for us in the Word of God as historical. And not only being historical, but that the living Christ can work in us a present-day living experience with God. That we can be made near to God by receiving Jesus Christ as our own personal Savior. And when he comes into our hearts and lives, he is our hope of eternal glory. Now, today, we live in a world that is skeptical of the existence of God. Very skeptical of the existence of God. And of course the big question today is can modern man know God? Many people know God, know about God, but they really don't know God. And of course what we have today is a lot of intellectualism. We got a lot of doctors of theology who are skeptics, who are promoting false teachings, who have turned away from the Holy Scriptures, who are declaring that the Bible only contains the Word of God, and so forth. Somehow or other, we have dropped this word fundamental. We used to have modernists and fundamentalists, but we don't even have fundamentalists anymore because many of the so-called fundamentalists are not fundamental anymore. In fact, to believe in fundamental churches is almost mythical because we have forsaken the Word of God. We have Christianity without experience. God has ordained that our relationship with Him would be an experience. That we in our present time would experience the presence, the power, the purpose, the preservation, and the protection of the living God. That we can know God and we can know him in a present day experience that begins with the new birth. When we personally, individually receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. 
I talked with a man one day, a good friend of mine. He had a friend he was trying to lead to the Lord. And he said to me, he said, do you know of any book that I can buy and give to this man to convince him that there is a God? And then he says to me, how do we know for sure he is a God? And this man professed to be a Christian. And I said to him, you know, I am very glad you asked me that question because that's one of the very simplest questions I've ever been asked for a long time. How do I know there is a God? Well, I said, all you have to do is look up into the heavens and the heavens declare the glory of God. I said, the second thing that every man knows in his own heart and conscience, there is a God. And how do I know that? Because he's afraid to die. Because he's afraid of the judgment. He don't die like a dog. Because if he dies like a dog, he goes out of existence. But when he dies, there's a judgment, and he's afraid to die. The third witness that we have is the Word of God, the oldest Bible has been recorded, and it testifies freely and openly, and if he don't believe this book, he won't believe any book that you can give him. Jesus gave a powerful witness of the existence of the living God, and he said, you can look at me, and I am a living testimony of my Father. What my father says, I say. What my father does, I do. The second great witness, we've already mentioned that the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows us handiwork. From the brightness of the heavens, we understand that God is light. The father of lights, in whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. The heavens never change. They're constant. They're there day after day, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, century after century, millennium after millennium. They never change. From the vastness of the extent of the heavens, we understand the immensity of God. Their height by his transcendency and sovereignty, their influence upon the earth, his dominion, providence, and universal goodness. To the children of men. The heavens reveal his mighty power by which they were made and continue to the day according to this day, according to the ordinances that were settled at that particular time. The book of Colossians says that by him all things consist. Can you imagine a universe? What a disaster and a calamity. Even if one star got out of its orbit. Can you imagine the disaster that would happen in the universe? The earth itself is filled with the glory of the Lord. The majestic mountains, the great rivers and lakes, the beautiful valleys, the flora and the fauna, they all testify. There is a God who made them. Who was the designer? Who gave them life? Who determined the length of life? And so forth. The scripture reminds us that the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead. The third witness this morning is our conscience. That the God of creation, he speaks in distinct, and authoritative tones to the very conscience of man. I remember as a young fellow 
struggling with these issues of life. Is there a God or is there no God? And we would like to believe there is no God. Because if there's no God, we're not accountable. But the problem is that even in our unbelieving state, our conscience won't buy it. Won't buy it. It's an interesting thing that ungodly men in times of drought, they'll begin to say, you know, I think it's time we start to pray for rain. Why would you pray if there's no God? There's the old saying, there's no atheists in foxholes. I saw some of the military men that come back from World War II, ungodly men, cursing, swearing, drinking, carousing, and so forth. And they would tell you about some instance and experience when great danger. And they would say, we prayed. Why pray if there's no God? Because everyone knows in their conscience there is a God. The entire nature of man testifies of the existence of God in his constant need to worship and his const constant search to find the cause and the effect of the universe. There's that longing, that yearning, that searching to know. We're all old enough to know that behind everything that happens in life there is a cause. And with that cause there is an effect. It produces an effect. This is the way the universe operates. is by cause and effect. There is a reason. The God of the Bible, the God of the universe, the God of genuine Christianity is one God. It's a singular word, word with a plural meaning. Much like the word that we talk about a crowd, a flock, a herd, it's only one. But within, there are many. And within this one God, there are three. In fact, if you read your Bible very closely, it tells us that there are seven. Seven spirits of God. Perfection in the Godhead. The triune God. Three distinct persons, self-existing, life-giving, every one of whom is the Godhead, yet supremely conscious of the other two. The Father creates. The Son redeems. The Holy Spirit sanctifies. The Father loves. The Son gives life. The Holy Spirit empowers. Yet in each operation, all are present. In both Testaments, we see glimpses of the plurality of the Godhead. Three distinct persons, not three manifestations of God. We have a sect in Christianity today that believes Jesus is the Father, Jesus is the Son, and Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And so they baptize in Jesus' name only. But that's contrary to Scripture. Jesus is not the Father. He is the Son. 
He is not the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Savior. The Holy Spirit is not the Savior. There's only one Savior, and that's Jesus. The Father didn't die on the cross. The Son died on the cross. The Holy Spirit did not rise from the dead. Christ rose from the dead. The Holy Spirit was the instigator, the Spirit that raised him from the dead, the Spirit of power. And so when he rose from the dead, he rose in resurrection power, the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead can quicken our mortal bodies. Right in the very first book of the Bible, right in the very first chapter, the Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image. And of course, it's a unique thing that when God said, Let us, it was the triune God. And what did he make? A man in his image? A triune man. A man who is spirit, who is soul, and who is body. All present in one man. And we have three spirits, three persons, all present in one God. We have it in the Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 11. Let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. We have it in Matthew chapter 3. We read it this morning, the baptism of Jesus, the sun and the water, the Spirit descending like a dove, the Father, Father's voice from heaven, my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This trinity, triune, is an eternal fellowship, the bond of which is love and mercy and grace. And in that eternal fellowship there is a unity, both absolute and compound. Absolute in the sense of one person, but compound in the sense of unity in three persons. The Trinity of God reveals the unity of God as a compound unity, including three divine persons united in eternal and essential unity. There is no dissension and the Godhead, perfect harmony and unity. The book of Colossians itself speaks of the riches, of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom knowledge. It is God's desire that we know him. That we personally know him. That there is a reality in our life of God. That we do not worship a dead God. We do not worship an intellectual God. We worship a real God. And we experience the reality of his presence the moment that we're born into his kingdom. The purpose of God is to reveal himself to us in a personal way. You'll notice that when we're talking about the Old Testament saints, it says they walked with God. 
And as they walked with God, they heard the voice of God. You and I can hear the voice of God when we hear his word. It's the voice of God that speaks to our heart through his word by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is the Holy Spirit that brings reality into our life. That we can know God. Not know about him. Not intellectually. But in reality. That we can say, he is our God. He walks with me, talks with me, see Austin Miles said. It's the testimony of the saints of God. This is genuine Christianity. It comes with a full assurance. That's what we get when we have salvation. We have a full assurance that our sins have been forgiven and our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And the reality of that full assurance is we know we have peace with God. Simply because we believe he was delivered for our offenses and he was raised for our justification. And when we have that full assurance of understanding, then we come to the stage of acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. And we begin to recognize that in him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That he is the all-wise God and that he knows everything and so when we come into that condition where God knows everything, we have to lay aside our concepts, our thoughts, and our fallacies. We have to lay them aside and say, Father knows best. I've had to change my thinking hundreds of times about things in life. And I've learned long ago that because of the fall of man, my mind is warped and I don't even think right. And if I'm going to be conformed to the image of Christ, I'm going to have to change my thinking and begin to think like God thinks. And this book is how God thinks. This is the mind of Christ. This is the mind of the Lord. This is the word of God. He spoke out of his mind. He didn't speak out of a mythical, erethical atmosphere. He spoke out of his mind. God has a mind. It's the mind of the Lord. It's the word of God. Now, the Bible tells us that he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He promised you shall seek and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you. Many people don't want to find God. And they don't want God to find them either. Because when God finds them, and they begin to seek God, God says, you're a sinner, and you need to get saved. You need a transformation and a regeneration in your life if you're going to talk to me. We got scientists today who are looking for a universe without a creator and without a master. But they can never have peace in their heart 
and know that they have come to the reality of their findings until they admit there is a God. God said, you shall call upon me and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. The reward of seeking the Lord is revelation knowledge. When you and I begin to seek God, we're going to find him. And when we begin to seek God in our problems, we'll find him there too. And we'll also find the answers. There isn't a problem of man that God hasn't got the answer for. And that answer this morning is found in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Some years ago, I preached a whole series of sermons, I believe it was 25, that God has the answers. Twenty-five questions that people came to Jesus Christ with, and he gave them the answer. And they were the problem. Them twenty-five covered the basic problems of man, and Jesus Christ gave the answers to them. I preached on that twenty-five times, series in a row. God has the answers. And if we'll come to him, we can have the answers to our problem. Jesus said that no man knows the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. The Holy Scriptures, they are the revelation of God. They are the foundation of genuine Christian faith in the living God. And if ma modern man is to know God, He's going to have to turn to his Bible. We can experience God in nature. We can experience him in our conscience. But we'll never fully know God apart from the Bible. Because the scriptures are the full revelation of God. In fact, it's not only the full revelation... It's the only revelation and the last revelation. we got other people who are writing books and adding books on to the Bible and all this kind of thing. They're not of God. Because when the revelation was given by the Apostle John, the revelation ceased right there. And we're talking about today, I got a new revelation. No, you never got a new revelation. There's no revelation beyond this. What you got is a new illumination. The revelation has been there for 2,000 years. You just, all of a sudden, we've just dawned on us. That's illumination. That's not revelation. If modern man is going to know God, he's going to have to seek the truth. And he's going to have to seek the scriptures by reading, by studying, and by searching the scriptures. And it is a lifelong journey to know God. And being born of the Spirit is just the beginning of our search of knowing God. The honest seeker, to the honest seeker, the Holy Spirit gives spiritual understanding. He opens the eyes of our understanding. And what is the scripture saying to us this, this morning about the Trinity of God? Well, the first thing we note about the Trinity of God is that God is a spirit. We also find that those who are going to worship God, that they must worship him in spirit and in truth. That if we're not born of the Spirit, we cannot worship God. Oh, we can go through formalities. We can have a form of godliness and at the same time deny the very existence and power of God. We can sing the choruses and the hymns and attend church and do all kinds of things. 
but it is not a spiritual worship, and much of the worship that we know today is a spurious worship. We worship God out of our soul rather than out of our spirit. It's an interesting thing. Any man that's born again, any person that's born again, the preacher don't need to preach very long until you come to the conclusion this man don't know God. Why? Because there's no anointing on his preaching. There's no spirit about it. He's giving us a nice lecture, a nice talk. What he may be saying is even true. But there's no spiritual power in it. They may sing a beautiful song. But there's a difference between a song in the spirit than there is just a good singer on the platform. <laughs> I, I remember years ago, we had a couple in our church, they loved to sing, but they loved to sing, but they couldn't sing. And they would always want to sing. And so I would let them sing. And you know, no, oh, they would hit sour notes and everything else, but they were a blessing to the congregation because they never sang once without the feeling, the tears, the anointing, and the blessing upon their singing. You see, God is a spirit. They must worship in spirit and in truth. And because he is a spirit, he is invisible. That no man has ever, with his naked eyes, Seen God. Jesus said that he that has seen me has seen the Father, but he was always veiled in human flesh. He was the Word made flesh. We also note that the Godhead is eternal. Everlasting, without beginning, without ending, from everlasting to everlasting, unaffected by time. Immortal, never dying, living and lasting forever. Incorruptible, holy sinless, perfect, without corruption, infinite, unlimited in greatness, immensity, God's presence in space, omnipresent, unlimited in power, omnipotent, Sovereign, ruling, reigning, controlling, unlimited in knowledge, the all-wise God, omniscient, always doing the right thing in the right way at the right time, righteous, doing those things that justify the sinner. The Trinity is unchangeable. The Father of lights, with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Trinity is unchangeable in their being, in their purpose, in their wisdom, in their power, in their holiness, in their justice, in their goodness, in their truth. We have a concept today that truth changes from generation to generation. Truth is truth. It never changes. Light is light. 
never changes. Lies are lies. They never change. The Trinity is unchangeable. God has not changed his mind about eternal life. That eternal life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He believeth not on the Son hath, shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. This morning, Hugh and I are not dealing with temporal values. We're dealing with eternity. With the God of eternity. The God whom someday we shall meet face to face. I think of the testimony of Job. He says, I know my Redeemer liveth, and I know that someday that I shall see him face to face. The Trinity is unchangeable in transcendence, in imminence. Transcendence meaning his, ex his separation from and his exaltation above anything that he's ever created. That we have to recognize that everything as we know it today is either one or the other. It's either creator or creation. There's only one creator, and all the rest is creation. And he is separate from his creation. A great difference in his creation. By imminence, we mean his presence in the world and his nearness to man. Then in spite of his greatness, his power, and his perfection, he has the ability to draw near to sinful man and to make sinful man conscious of his presence. I don't know about you, but I like living in the presence of God. I like that. There's a perfection, a holiness, a quietness, a peacefulness in the presence of God. I like to go into a home and you just sense the presence of God in this place. I talked to a man a while back. He hardly knew me. He just, and, you know, we just talked a minute. He said, I just sense the presence of God in you. And how do we sense the presence of God in us? Because we spend time in his presence. His presence rubs off. The glory that's on him rubs off on, on us. His glory shall be revealed in us. Isaiah the prophet said, The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. The glory of the Lord. You can go into a home where they've had a whole battle and a whole fighting and whatnot, and you don't even know anything about it. And you come into the you come into this home and you know one thing for sure. There's no peace in this house. They didn't tell you anything, you just said. But why? Because if you live in the spirit, you can pick up that spirit. You can pick up a spirit of jealousy, a spirit of covetousness. A spirit of confusion. You see, there are many spirits today, but you can pick up a spirit of God. There's peace in this place. Wonderful person that. I like to be around those kind of people. I like to be in the presence of God. My wife and I, we have it every morning. We spend that time in the presence of God. The Trinity is separate from man in time, in space, in nature, 
and in character. God is eternal. Man in this world is temporal. God is in heaven. Man is on earth. God is perfect. Man is imperfect. God is divine. Man is human. God is morally perfect. Man is sinful. And this morning, God is sovereign. That he has an absolute right to govern and dispose of his creatures as he pleases. That the very breath that you and I breathe is in the hand of God. He determines the day of our birth and also the day of our death. Did you know that Jesus Christ is he who was dead and is alive and is alive forevermore? And he has the keys of hell and of death. And whether we recognize it or not, when he opens that door, we're going whether we want to or not. God is sovereign. He is the almighty God. He has the power to withhold rain. He has the power to give rain. The disciples even come to the conclusion, even the winds and the waves obey him. He has the power to raise up people and he has the power to cast people down. I was talking to Rose this morning about this. That a few years back, the threat to the world was Nazism, Hitler, Germany. And that power fell and communism rose. Communism fell, the Muslim empire rose. And if the Lord don't come, it'll fall and we'll have another one. But the Bible says God has raised up a standard against it. And that's the Christian church. We have this morning the very fact that God can intervene at any time he chooses. This morning we want to consider a few moments the seven attributes, the characteristic qualities of the Trinity. Holiness, separate from his creation and they, uh, his creation and nature and character. Righteousness, that he's just, upright, and honorable. Right dealing with all his creatures. Faithful. Absolutely trustworthy. That his word will not fail. Merciful. Always ready to forgive. In fact, the Bible says his mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. Gracious. Always extending his favor and power. Grace that is greater than all of our sin. Love. Unconditional. Ab always abounding. The giving of his only begotten son. And then we got goodness, that God is good, that leads to repentance and eventually to eternal life. And then there's the sevenfold function of the Trinity inspiration, atonement, regeneration, sanctification, mediation, consolation, and judgment. Two great works of God, creation and redemption, the great works of God. This morning, when we think of the greatness of our God, the very scriptures that's been given to us, the knowledge, the understanding, the experiencing of his presence and of his power, that it has influenced civilizations, transformed lives, brought light, inspired and comforted, comfort to millions. And that power is still at work in the world today. And hundreds of lives today are experiencing God's presence 
and power, and especially those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that they can know God. And the call of God today is going out across the world to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And whosoever will may come and take of the water of life freely. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This eternal life is in the Son of God. That's the purpose we, we celebrate Christmas. And that is the purpose we celebrate Easter. And this is the foundational truth of genuine Christianity. Is to know God. And to know God, we must be born again of the Spirit of God. Shall we pray? Father, today, we thank you for the good word of God. We thank you, our God, that you have been so gracious and merciful to us to reveal yourself to us, to reveal to us how, just how lost, how sinful, how corrupt, how weak, and how temporal we really are. That death at any time is only a step away. And yet, we know that eternal life is as close as a moment in when we call on God to save us from our sins. And our Father, we thank you, our God, today that you're not willing any should perish, but all should come to repentance, that you will of all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We thank you for the glorious light of the gospel, and that very wisdom and treasure that has been hid in the heart and the mind of God, that we might have those treasures in our own earthen vessels. Not the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of God, that very knowledge of God brings that revelation and understanding. And we thank you, our God, today that you have revealed to yourself to us in an experiential moment when we recognized that Christ died for our sins and rose again from the dead. When the peace of God came, when the assurance of salvation, the knowledge our names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and our Father God that you've assured us that you will be with us until the end of the age, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And our desire today is to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, to be conscious always of your presence, of your power, of your provision, and of your protection in our daily life. And our Father God, that we will walk softly and carefully before our God in the fear of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray this morning. Amen and amen.